Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, it's been a few months since we've covered some Johnny Harris content. And if you don't know, Johnny Harris, who has a massive YouTube channel, is one of the most popular independent journalist YouTubers out there. And the big thing I like to do with Johnny Harris videos with my commentary is to make sure the historical context of a lot of the geopolitics that he talks about is covered. Because you've probably heard me repeatedly say you cannot understand the present without understanding the past. And sometimes his videos have lacked that. And the video he just put out a few days ago is called The U.S. Military is Planning for a War with China. Now that title might be a little hyperbolic to get views. And of course I understand that. But the topic is going to be really important to understand the context of. So I'm going to check this out and insert some commentary. And of course let me know what you think. I'd love to see your comments down below. All right, the original video link is going to be down below. And with that, let's just go ahead and get started. Now, the one thing I'll say about Johnny Harris is he's an incredible editor and kind of graphic artist. His videos always look so nice. But let's uh, go ahead and get started. All right, again, U.S. military is planning on a war with China. All right, let's see if this is hyperbolic or not. There's a small volcanic island off the southern coast of Japan called Magashima. Nobody lives Full here. Full island chain is volcanic. But here's footage from January 2023 of construction workers arriving to this island. Seven the months ago from when I'm looking at this. to build a couple of runways on the island and some storage facilities for ammunition. The Japanese government has been paying local fishermen to stay away from this island. That's... By the way, this whole process, like you're saying, sorry, I, I hope I don't interrupt too much, but I got to tell you context, that whole process of using these islands, because a lot of them aren't going to be great for like living conditions, but they're great for, again, getting uh, a, a, a harbor in, getting a land strip in so you can do that. They did that all over the place in uh, World War II, U.S. and Japan did that. So it's not not an uncommon thing what he's mentioning right now because they're turning it into years. a military base. The island is being built by Japan, but one of its main purposes has to do with the United States. American fighter jets and aircraft carriers have had to do their drills and practices down here on this island, but now they're able to station at this island, moving them much closer to this ocean and to one country in particular. Now, it's important to understand that Japan is an ally of the United States. Basically, it was a forced ally as it was part of the conditions for the Japanese surrender. Um, as part of the conditions of that, Japan does not have a military. And the United States has kind of been the proxy for a potential Japanese military need. So there's a huge military presence of the United States in Japan, which, of course, is very close to China, which, as you can imagine, would make China very apprehensive. Magashima is just one of many islands that are being loaded up with military hardware, most of it coming from the United States. It's part of Philippines as well. of militarized islands, an effort of defense or aggression, depending on how you look at it. It's a lot. Um, the Philippines era of that goes back to the Spanish-American War um, at the turn of the, the uh, 20th century. So U.S. presence in the Philippines has been well over 100 years. Um, even after the, Philippine, uh, the Philippines got its independence after World War II, the United States has a still a massive presence there. Line that centers on Taiwan. I hope they give the, and the obviously the, the context of Taiwan. To when they said that 2023 is likely to stand as the most transformative year in U.S. force posture in this region in a generation. This line is a symbol of the okay. rising tensions between global superpowers, and I want to show you why this is happening now and what it means for the future of this conflict. This is unlike anything the U.S. Navy has done since World War II. Tensions are rising in one of the most hotly contested regions on the planet, the South China Sea. It's going to be interesting because the struggle they're talking about is not going to be the one in in political views or even like actions against each other. It's it's economic, right? This is an economic competition, right, with the two biggest economies on the planet. And um, the apprehension, too, that each other is going to, you know, be the top dog economic power. And China has definitely made a big stride with that, with a lot of their policies, outsourcing. And um, now, which is being very popular, is China funding projects of other countries, right? A little bit of economic imperialism, uh, not unlike United States economic imperialism um, since the Industrial Revolution. 
Hey, I'm um, going to pause the story really is. quick to tell you about uh, today's sponsor, Co time? Pilot, which is a product that I actually use almost every day of my life. Copilot is a platform where you get paired up with... Uh, if you want to check that out, okay, I, I don't like to, um, you know, just ignore people's sponsors. Sponsors are a huge part of how YouTubers can do what they need to do. But in the original video link, I'll let you do that because I know um, a lot of you would probably like me to maybe skip forward a little bit. So, but yeah. I want to, of course, support that, but let me go ahead and just jump ahead a little bit. Good Johnny, get in shape. <laughs> All right. About ready. All right, here we go. All right, here. Pilot for sponsoring today's video. Let's dive back into this important story. Here we go. Okay, so he always has the papers this out document to make it look US you know, Department cool. of Defense. This document is called the National Defense Strategy of the United States of America, which also includes the Nuclear Posture Review and Missile Defense Review. That's it's basically scary. a report that they release every four years that gives us an understanding of what the US military is up to, what they care about. I have to check that out. That's public information. Is it not like hurting? national security issues but this year i'm sure it's very vague is more detailed than normal the document focuses a lot on china if china threatens our sovereignty concerns directly with china the dod you gotta you gotta again ask again like what 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 sovereignty do you think i mean do you think americans think about those that think that american sovereignty is threatened by china what do you think that means like what is actually being threatened says that China, quote, remains our most consequential strategic competitor for coming decades. Why? Because, the Pentagon says, China is bullying its neighbors to, quote, reshape the region and the international system to fit its authoritarian preferences. Now, remember that the United States, who spends loads on its... You agree with that statement? I mean, what... What's the wording? And preferences. Okay, authoritarian preferences. Meaning, meaning what though? Like, they want other people, other trying to pressure other places to be authoritarian, or are they talking about like imperialism? The, the threat they think China is going to be taking, like literally taking over countries, not necessarily trade agreements or something like that. But now remember, that that's vague. From, I, I think from American policy on its military. What is the threat? The rules for our global order. How we trade, what political systems we favor, who participates in the system. And now we see a country that wants to dethrone them, to create a new system based on other values and other rules. It's like how they're getting and to what economic the promise. US military is that China is rapidly modernizing and expanding their military. China's military is True. growing incredibly yeah. fast. Like they deploy the equivalent of an entire new British Navy every four years. Every four years is like new new British Navy, like new Royal Navy every four years. Yeah, they're just growing very quickly. This report is still not close to the United States, of course, military size. So um is it this idea and this this happened back in kind of the age of imperialism in 1800s where economic growth was followed by military growth to have the military to be able to defend economic interests so is that what china is doing right here concerned about china's growing strength and military footprint How China is coercing its neighbors, disregarding ocean boundaries, testing missiles, bullying fishing vessels in other countries' waters, building islands and military bases on those islands, and flying over other countries' airspace. And especially in Taiwan, the island that China claims as their own and where the globe gets nearly all of their advanced microchips, which yeah. is a topic I made an entire video about. <laughs> and why the United States wants to defend them. Uh, Chinese Civil War, I don't know if he's getting to that. If you don't know, just real quick, um, the root of the competition between, between uh, China and Taiwan goes back to the Chinese Civil War, which um, bookended the uh, uh, World War II. And essentially what happened is um, the uh, Communist Party, Communist group led by Mao Zedong, um, had you know successfully basically taken over mainland China and the Nationalist Party um, ended up fly fleeing to Taiwan, where they believe at least that they were still the justified government because they were kind of the previous government and were operating out of Taiwan. They felt they were legitimate, honestly, like legitimate rulers of China still, right? 
Um, although they had no real influence there, but at least they claimed, you know, that. But then, you know, the the uh, uh, communists, you know, when when the civil war is over and they take over, I believe that Taiwan as a place that was um, um, got its independence right from Japan because Japan had had invaded it. Uh, should have been part of China. So like today, mainland China believes that Taiwan is part of China and should be, and the Taiwanese no longer feel that. And since uh, the Taiwanese are economic partners um, and have been supported by the United States, the United States has a lot of interest in Taiwan. So that's your brief context there. The point is Taiwan is an incredibly important island for the United States. All of this together makes China, quote, the only country that has the intent and power to actually challenge the U.S.-led global order and rewrite global rules and norms, something the U.S. has gotten really comfortable doing over the last seven sure. years. So this is why the U.S. considers China the most consequential strategic competitor for coming decades. And They've created a plan to respond, and in their words, we cannot delay. They give themselves this 10-year window to implement some major changes, and this is what it looks like. Okay, first things first. The U.S. military is already very present in Asia. We've got about 8,000 troops in Guam. We've got over 100 bases in Japan with about 21,000 American troops on the mainland. Get a lot of start Spanish American war. stationed down here on the Japanese island of Okinawa. Go up to South Korea and you'll find 22,000 U.S. troops. Oops. And then you've got the U.S. Navy who operates. And again, you've, you again, I hope because I didn't really talk about it with Japan being completely demilitarized after World War II. If you're looking at those numbers and you're like, those are insane numbers. How can they get away with that? Are they taking over Japan? These were part of forced agreements after World War II where the United States military is like literally the Japanese military. So these numbers are huge. And again, that's why out of this port in Singapore. This has been the status quo yeah, in Asia always... for decades. And it has been the way that the US has ensured security for its allies. And it's kind of mostly worked to help secure American interests and deter conflict. The US has maintained strong alliances. Yeah, in I mean, that's 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 based on the predication that you would think China wants to like invade Japan or something like that. And I don't know, there's not really a context for that. Um, other than, you know, <laughs> Japan has brutally occupied uh parts of china you know over the last 150 years it's been brutal there but that's based on the precedent of you know with that um he's not talking about north korea yet uh because well it's really i guess not the topic of the video so my question would then be to challenge that a little bit is um that heightened military involvement with china is that justified based on them literally being surrounded when you look at this map here surrounded by in a way like american client states right they feel surrounded by that by their economic rival in this region and frankly the pentagon has kind of been distracted with other things two wars that happened in the middle east over the past 20 years my fellow citizens my fellow citizens, my fellow citizens. but as those conflicts right. wind down and as china militarizes the department of defense says that china's status and picking up pieces quo, of those these wars troops too. in asia it's not enough they talk about this new kind of deterrence integrated deterrence the only kind of military posture that will Just actually keep china big word bay. salad and this is what it looks like the small the smallest part of the strategy has to do with American bases. They're going to reopen a base in Guam and move some troops there. But the majority of this strategy has to do with American allies in Asia. Allies that are in all over the step place. with the U.S.'s goal to deter and contain China. The Pentagon calls partnering with its like allies Cold War, the Cold War politics, of gravity huh? for this strategy. So let's start with Japan, one of the U.S.'s closest allies in the region. And Japan is a country that is deeply concerned about a more powerful China with its massive navy and its ambitions to control Taiwan. And it's very easy to forget that Japan isn't just this. It's actually all of this. It extends way down here because of all these islands. So they're saying that the Japanese are afraid of what exactly? China taking over those islands? Right? Now, question be for you guys, if the United States military presence wasn't there, Japan was building up their own military presence, do you think that would happen? And for what goal? I'm not hearing in here. I'm definitely, you know, obviously this, this I mean, it's titled the U.S. military is planning for war on China, but it's really important. And I'll, I'll try to do this best I can. Um, there's you got to bring in the Chinese perspective of all this, like all these things that they're doing. It's why. And you better be accurate in where you say why, because. These are things that, if handled improperly, can lead to catastrophes. 
These islands curve nicely all the way down till they hit Taiwan. All of these are Japanese islands. I mean, if you look at Japan's national defense strategy translated into English, you will see something that looks strikingly similar to what the Pentagon released. They're both really freaked out about China and they both are ready to act in lockstep to deter a more aggressive China in the region. So it starts up here with that island that we talked about sure. at the beginning, Magashima, this new military base and airstrip to be used by both Japanese and US militaries. Further south is Amami Island, where Japan has recently added long range missiles and anti-ship missiles. Potentially they're gonna add cruise missiles. These are missiles that they're buying from the United States. These are missiles that are definitely in range of the Taiwan Strait. Next to the chain is Okinawa, where the US has a huge Huge presence of tens of thousands of troops already. Now, do you think with uh, if if it wasn't for American interest in Taiwan, do you think Japan would have this type of interest in Taiwan? Japan also has military bases here and is adding even more long-range missiles. I mean, they don't claim it anymore. Warfare units, which are military installations meant to disrupt and deny communication signals. On these two islands down here, they're adding even more long-range missiles, which could potentially be used to attack Chinese. Can you see with all this why? And Japan what China's is feeling probably like troops on Ishigaki as well. And finally, you've got this last. Of course, we got a bulk up. You know, that's probably what they're saying. Look at what's happening. The closest island to Taiwan, and here Japan is adding more of those electronic warfare units, which are used to jam communication signals or to listen in on their communications. You know, they're right next to China. Japan is also positioning more troops here. So this is the first part of our chain. Okay. And compared with training that Japan and U.S. troops are doing to simulate island and amphibious warfare, it sends a really strong signal to China that Japan is ready to respond if needed. This line also serves as like a physical barrier that any Chinese ship or submarine would have to pass through in order to access the Pacific Ocean. It's a line that Japan can easily control and monitor. And so is it, is it trying to be... Um a blockade economically i mean are chinese ships being able to go through there to cross the pacific i actually don't know i would think if if they were actually doing a blockade that would be a huge deal and it also builds a wall of missiles any calculus that china is making on whether or not to invade taiwan or to do anything in the region will have to now factor in this wall of missiles ready to roll overall this increased military presence on this chain of islands gives japan and by extension the united states the ability to monitor communications and troop movements of china preparing them to act quickly and it also gives them the ability to pre-position troops and supplies throughout the region which is a major logistical advantage but all of this yeah. comes with a massive price tag. So Ugh. Japan, which is formerly a pacifist nation without like a huge military, is actually planning to double their defense. <laughs> They're forced to be a pacifist nation, right? We saw, you know, what happened in the 20th century. So um, they couldn't if they wanted to. They're spending way more on buying weapons than they ever have before. And 97% of those weapons are coming from the United States. The island chain strategy continues. Or is, is all of this, this militarization, just an extension of military industrial complex of the <laughs> huge amount of money that's being made by private contractors, right? In the United States that, that develop arms and sell that stuff. Is that more about why this is? It's just for economics, for American economics to make money. Right, both from the uh, public and private sector. Continues down here by public the Philippines. I, mean, I don't. Close I mean, to the Taiwan government. and close to the South China Sea. The U.S. knows that it needs to bolster its presence here, but it's not as straightforward as it is in Japan. The Philippines was a U.S. colony for decades. It's a very sensitive history, and even after Filipino independence, right. the U.S. maintained a military presence in the Philippines right. until like the 90s, and then they eventually yeah. kicked out the U.S. As many saw it as just an enduring legacy of U.S. colonialism. But a For more sure. aggressive China has become a major threat to the Philippines. Now listen, I'm not going to uh, go into brutal, like a Brutal, uh, I don't know if he's getting into context here. The Japanese occupation of the Philippines was brutal, absolutely brutal. They hated, uh, you know, the Japanese and stuff like that. So they've had a history of imperialism um, in their country and want independence. So the United States, you know, drove out the Japanese. Um, well, actually, first, we got to go way back. It was colonized by the Spanish. And... 
that didn't go great. It was better than the span or the a lot better than the Japanese era than the Japan or then the Americans came in because the Philippines was then controlled by the um, Americans in the early 1900s. Then the Japanese came right booted out the Americans Americans come back. And, you know, a lot of Filipinos are like, uh, can we like have our country finally? And you saw until the 90s that really didn't happen. South China Sea thing. Well, a here, century. Just know saying. that China claims all of this as their maritime boundary. It's literally a line with nine dashes that some Chinese official in 1948 drew by hand on a map. Yep. This line and I can almost through the boundaries that the rest of the world recognizes. I was going to say that when you do boundaries like this, they're very rarely agreed upon by both sides. I bet both of the, you know, both the Americans and the Chinese, the Japanese, Filipinos, all that stuff disagree on that because they're like how much of our airspace uh do we control and also like how far off the coast is uh is our border border for even international waters let alone someone else so every everybody's always going to be able to make a case that someone else is entering their airspace or their coastal regions because stuff like this is almost impossible to agree upon as the like Filipino you know, territorial waters. So there's a conflict in the ocean. And now on a daily basis, Filipino fishing vessels are harassed by Chinese military vessels who threaten <laughs> them if they don't leave their oh, no. waters. In 2022, China put a temporary stop yeah. to all fishing in the South China Sea, denying the Philippines ability to fish in the West Philippine Sea, which That's is huge. rightfully their, their waters. But it's crazier yeah, than that. The Chinese lives. Navy is like full blown just bullying the Philippines. They like show up with lasers to harass and blind Filipino ships. Like I mean, let's remember, the Philippines the movie is a theater. much smaller nation yeah. than China and doesn't really have a navy even close to what China has. And so now they're in this lacking the American decision. Presence. They have to choose between giving up their sovereignty and fishing rights to their aggressive neighbor, China, or partnering with their former colonizer who also wants to repel China. And in this case, they chose the latter. But China has pushed too hard. It's pushed you have to. I mean, it kind of have to. In the South China Sea, what they call the West Philippine Sea. The it's been very disagreed upon. I mean, people just. I mean, it seems like globally China don't like how China has claimed so much of the, the South China Sea for the first time in 22 years. The U.S. Even if it is just defensively, be in bases that are owned by the Philippines, but the U.S. can have troops, build barracks, and other military installations, and can have pre-positioned supplies there as well. It's basically like the U.S. has bases there, but it's like shh, it's actually the Philippines. And as part of all of this, all of whatever you want, about, in late 2022, they expanded their agreement, giving the U.S. military access to four more bases, bringing the total number of bases on the Philippines up to nine. And, and a big issue where they selected to oh, put them here in the north of the country. And a big issue like the Philippines is going to be apprehensive of that, because in so many of these cases where maybe the United States is brought and maybe even they're even asked to come help, but <laughs> getting them to leave after is something that doesn't happen, you know, every time. Strategically close to Taiwan and helping fill their gap in their island chain that they're creating. This now allows U.S. to have a military presence really close to Taiwan. The U.S. trains very closely with their Filipino counterparts, making them ready to respond very quickly to an invasion in Taiwan, while also repelling Chinese bullying of Filipino fishing activity. Okay, so now the island chain is filling out, or giving fishermen. the U.S. and its regional partners a solid blockade to the Pacific. And it continues all the way down around the South China Sea because of the U.S. presence in Singapore. And you can't you can't expect China to be OK with this, right, with this literally a blockade. I mean, their economy is completely tied to it as well. But at the same time, they're pressuring others. So, you know, it's like you got to look at both of these sides and not even necessarily that you agree with like, hey, who's right in this situation or who wrong, like whatever. But you have to understand the points of view. Right. And then it, then you get an explanation for the actions that are happening, right? You can do it. That's how you be unbiased or at least uh, try to be and then try to make a conclusion that is based on reality. This is a very united front, but it doesn't stop here. The last part of the strategy is potentially the most significant, and it has to do with Australia, a country that is also alarmed by China's rise in the region. Yeah. So there's this military pact between the US, the UK, and Australia. It's called AUKUS. What it means is that Whoa. these three countries awful work name. together to create a unified <laughs> submarine force that will patrol the Pacific. First, what it means is that the US is giving, giving nuclear submarine technology, its most powerful and advanced weapon, 
freely to Australia. Here, here are the designs to our most powerful weapons. Take them, foreign country. And then- Okay, I hope Johnny is very, very, he has confirmed that that's what they mean by that. Nuclear submarines does not mean that the submarine is capable of launching nukes. It's nuclear powered, right? So that they can um, be submerged for a long time. Now, I'm not saying Johnny's wrong here. I just hope he understands that. Um, I would like to know more about that. I mean, nuclear technology, British have already had that. They, you know, they already had that. And of course, America, the United States um, helped with that stuff. But I want to make sure that that gets kind of fact checked because that's a huge deal. But again, nuclear submarine doesn't necessarily mean it's a nuclear weapon, it's nuclear powered. The US and UK will base submarines out of this port here in Australia, it's called Perth. Australian sailors will ride alongside US and UK sailors during submarine deployments. <laughs> they will learn together, they will work together, they will share classified intelligence. What this means is that there will be a significantly larger number of submarines patrolling these waters. And remember, these are nuclear powered submarines, which we made a whole video on as well. These things can be underwater for months. They can go on these long patrols over to Taiwan and the South China Sea. They'll buy that they can power close source. up these key choke points, plugging holes in their growing line against China. And crucially, we can be pretty damn I'm certain that a lot of these submarines will be carrying nuclear weapons, adding yet another layer of deterring power to an already really powerful line of defense. And if this wasn't enough, Australia is also building a permanent hangar for US B-52 bombers yeah. up here in the Tyndall That's Air old Base school. in Northern Australia. Old these US bombers carry conventional weapons, but they also carry nukes. So now, US bombers carrying nuclear weapons will have a permanent home in Australia. There's gonna be a lot more more military hardware in the Pacific because of this hardware you know, that carries the most powerful and dangerous weapons we have. This is a this also makes me think about how, if you've heard, China's also been in, in, uh, investing a lot into um, land-based uh, economic infrastructure. So, if you've heard it, they they've kind of named it like China China's new Silk Road. They're trying to make more on-ground transportation for economic stuffs across China. Um, to trade with, you know, west of China in the Middle East and, you know, as far west as they can get. So I wonder if that has helped spur that on is they see that, you know, the, the maritime trade, right, by water here is, you know, very threatened that they're investing that. China is, you can tell, always trying to be a step ahead of these things. So even without, I mean, it would kill their economy, obviously not having these trade ships, because that's when, you know, the, and, and you know what's ironic about all this is, like, the economic relationship for China and the United States is still very strong. They're still, you know, they come across and America and the United States, we buy their goods and all that stuff, while at the same time posturing these military fronts at the same time. But it shows how important the economic relationship is that even they claim to be economic enemies, they still rely like is the United States especially still relies on China so much. It's a very aggressive signal to China that the West is ready. So August. now, if you look at the whole thing, this whole chain, you see how robust this presence is. This is what that military official meant by transformative. The military name for this is the first island chain, and it is at the heart of the US and its allies' strategy to counter and contain China. And it's easy to see that this island chain, while protecting a lot of different interests for a lot of different countries, really centers on Taiwan. A major purpose for all of this militarization, the missiles, right. the the subs, the air bases, the That's where you do get into the political stuff and not just economic stuff. And this is Taiwan. where we get to the paradox of deterrence. You prepare to fight so that you don't have to fight. All of this preparation might be just what is needed for China to decide that it would be too costly to invade Taiwan. But Anyone getting World War One vibes, right? Four main long-term causes of World War One: Militarism, main, M-A-I-N, right? Uh, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism, militarism. There was a general belief in the turn of the 20th century that enormous standing armies were actually keeping the world safer, right? Because it would be a deterrent, like you wouldn't attack somebody because their military is so strong. And unfortunately with World War I, what, the, or what that ended up doing was just ensuring that if a war was to happen, it would be a small scale, it would be massive in scale. And obviously you hope, you know, something like that wouldn't happen here.
But the other side of that paradox Militarism. is that I mean, all really. of this looks an awful lot like overt escalation in a conflict. That's how China, China probably feels. This chain of islands is clearly your enemy trying to box you in, to monitor your every move. A superpower from the other side of the world flooding your region with more military hardware to stop your influence. Uh, it would be impossible for this plan to not contribute to a rising of tensions between right. the two superpowers. You know, because this would not be hard for the Chinese to paint as overly aggressive, like to their public, to their government, to their military, everything is, you could easily say they're obviously the bad guys. Like we're not doing anything. Okay. I mean, the, the, the Taiwan thing, they're not going to drop that, that claim that just never happens, but all the other stuff they are feeling like they're definitely, they're definitely going to feel like they're the victims. All this as the U.S. prepares for a potential conflict with China. How close are we to all out conflict between the world's two largest superpowers? I don't think it's as close as this is. So many people are making it, especially across media. Chinese President Xi Jinping has already called this a policy of encirclement and suppression. And let's be honest, he's right. Whether you like it or not, yeah. this is containment. It is. Old school, Cold War style containment. Johnny's it's hard right. not to see it when you look at this map. And the Chinese foreign minister said that it would literally be impossible for China to not fight back to take a move that retaliates against this move, which means that if the US and its allies aren't careful with all of this, it may send a signal to earlier. China that now is the time to invade Taiwan before all of this plan can fully be implemented. In that sense, the strategy could provoke the very conflict that it is trying to deter. Okay, I'm um, gonna give you my final thoughts. Don't go anywhere. All right, not to get nitpicky, but I, I feel like the his his conclusion there was good. And I think it, and hopefully I helped with this, is giving some of the context of what China is feeling, right? And it really wasn't, I mean, he kind of just put it at the end, but never really, never really discussed that as it was going on. Um, and I think it would give, it, it, his conclusion would sit better if he gives more evidence of the Chinese opinions, um, opinions there. But again, I do think it was lacking some, co a little bit of context. And again, it's hard. I, I, I can't come down too hard because you want to make a video that's like 15, 20 minutes. And oh my gosh, I mean, you could make this so long. I mean, even just me adding on, I were, I'm like approaching 35 minutes of, uh, of, of dialogue here of adding context to it. But there was some really important things. So hopefully like hearing and, and getting, you know, I asked you questions and, um, getting my perspective of just adding the history stuff and not trying to tell you what you think the conclusion or the valuation of this conflict is, but able to make a more informed decision about this because, again, it, it could end up being nothing, right? Which is po possible. We know things get hyperbolic and uh, when you start, I mean, it doesn't help when you have the U.S. military is planning for a war with China, right? The title of this or the, the news bites you hear on, on, on uh, you know, uh, popular media. So, again, it could be on, on the scale either this could be a nothing burger, right? Um, or end up being like that. But the scary thing, like he's saying, too, is the opposite side of that. The worst case scenario. Do we have to say it? Could be, again, catastrophic. So anyway, um, uh, I appreciate, you know, Johnny doing his thing here and um, adding some of that stuff. Hopefully, again, uh, I was able to get you thinking about it. But anyway, I'd love to hear your opinions uh, down below on it about this situation, um, the different points of view. Uh, again, bring it up China's point of view. Uh, the United States point of view. And I mean, <laughs> you can make your own, own, own conclusion, which is who is more unjustifiably aggressive in this? Is it the United States or is it China? Hopefully the historical context they gave you will help you uh, make up your mind for yourself. All right. And with that, again, the original video down below, if you like Johnny's uh, video there, make sure you give, you know, like, subscribe, that kind of stuff. A lot of stuff like this uh, he's done. So if that's your style. Definitely support. It. All right. With that, we'll see you all next time. Bye.